If you love the Raiders, then go ahead and subscribe to the Las Vegas Raiders Report. We're giving you guys free videos every single day. So hit that big red button that says subscribe because if you were like me, walking into work today on Monday, I was in a really good mood. Not only are the Raiders 2-0, Chargers lost. And the Chiefs lost. If that doesn't put a smile on your face, I don't know what will. So before we get into today's show, hit that big red button that says subscribe. Raider Nation, what's going on? You guys are watching the Raiders Board. In today's show, I'm going to talk about the latest news, rumors, and I love overreaction Monday. So I'm going to give you the four juiciest stories, and I'm going to give you some overreaction to it. Plus, at the very end of today's show, I'm going to give you the biggest winners and losers up against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But I wouldn't be able to do today's show if it wasn't for our awesome sponsor, Savvy Lifestyle. There's a lot of tailgates. There's a lot of cookouts. If you plan on inviting some people over, you're probably going to be cutting up some food. Go ahead and get this deal that I got going on right now. 40% off. All you got to do is use code 40 Raiders at the link chatsports.com slash knife. So the news that we're going to get into today, speaking of getting cut, hell, maybe I should have put hashtag uh, Lawson in this one. The Raiders have cut Nevin Lawson. And I'm just going to say finally, right? I mean, this is one of those dudes who was suspended the first two weeks of the season for PEDs. And I was like, well, he was terrible last year and he was even terrible on the PED. So now they decide to get rid of him finally. So here's what the Raiders defensive back depth chart is going to be looking like going into week three up against the Miami Dolphins. Nobody really anticipated Lawson to really get a lot of playing time, though there was some rumors out there that he had at least a chance to start. But the biggest reason why the Raiders are making this move, Casey Hayward has played well. I've been impressed by Mullen as well. Some of the younger players have played okay in, at spurts. But the biggest reason why the Raiders said, Peace out, Lawson, is because of my man, Nate Hobbs. So I want every single one of y'all right now, down in the comments section, showing some love to the fifth round rookie out of Illinois. This is a guy who continues to show that he is really grasping this Gus Bradley defense and is continuing to grow on this Raiders defense. So peace out, Lawson. Shout out to Nate Hobbs. So now we're going to get into the four biggest stories that I'm seeing on the internet this Monday morning. The first one is like, Derek Carr. Is he an MVP candidate after beating the Ravens and after beating the Pittsburgh Steelers? I'm giving you Chucky heads on today's show. This one is absolutely for Chucky heads. Believe it, baby. I mean, he has to be, right? He leads the NFL with 817 passing yards. He, there's been only five quarterbacks in the Super Bowl era that have had 375 plus yards and two touchdowns in their first two games. The Raiders are 2-0, and and I mean, you can say what you want. But the fact that they're 2-0, as bad as the running game has been, as bad as the offensive line's been, one of the biggest reasons, sure, they got a lot of good skill position players out there, but it's because of the leadership of D.C. When he went down yesterday with that ankle injury, after the game, he was like, man, there's just no way I was leaving that game. And go 28-37, 382 yards, two touchdowns, and no picks on the road on a short week up against the Pittsburgh Steelers, who realistically just made Josh Allen look pretty bad the week before that. And they shut out. Like, I mean, you want to talk about just unbelievable play by Carr. He has to be in the MVP candidate discussion. He's also the only quarterback with over 700 passing yards. And guess what? He's got 817. So I'm going to make this the pinned comment on today's show. For those of you that have no idea what the heck that means, it means when you come across this video, the top comment is going to say, is Derek Carr an MVP candidate? And I'm going to say Y for yes or N for no. So every person that comes across the video, go to that top comment because you're going to get hit with the YouTube ad break. So guess what? You might as well go ahead and vote. All right, let's go to the number two story. Are the Raiders a top five defense right now? Before the year started, you know, I'd get asked, hey, top 20, top 15. And I always said, give it time, give it time. So in terms of the Raiders being a top five defense as it stands, I'm going to give this one two Chucky heads, and I'm going to say people are talking. For those of you that are new to the show, because we had over, what, 1,200 subscribers yesterday. When I say two Chucky heads, I mean it's like a 50-50 shot. Like it's, I kind of believe it. I kind of don't. But the fact that the Raiders have allowed 30 points in the last eight quarters, and that is including overtime for the Ravens and the Steelers, that deserves to be noted. I mean, one of the biggest issues with a Gus Bradley defense before was, or a Paul Gunther defense, the Raiders never made adjustments. The Ravens put up 14 points in that first quarter up against Las Vegas, and realistically since then, they've done a phenomenal job being able to get pressure. Their cornerbacks have stepped up. I've liked what I've seen out of the linebacking play, and they've had a lot of injuries. So the fact that they're also getting stops in important places, go back to that Steelers game yesterday. How many times last year were the Raiders 
Chargers take a lead. I believe it was like three or four times with the final two minutes of the game, and they lose. That didn't happen. Shout out to Gus Bradley. Shout out to this defense. Now, I'll tell you what. The defensive line here, Max Crosby, Yannick Gakwe, they've been cutting through the offensive line of the opposing defenses. And if you guys want to get your hands on a 17-piece professional knife set, go to chatsports.com slash knife. These are 40% off right now, usually $99.99. The reason why these are the perfect knives for any kind of Raiders tailgate, any kind of Raiders kitchen, stainless steel but they're blacked out as well you can also put them in the uh, what is it dishwasher that's the name of it right it's maybe still a little bit hungover i don't know we got pizza cutters all different kinds of scissors it's like six different types of crazy knives out there but if you want to go ahead and get this hook up you got to take advantage of it quick it's chatsports.com slash knife code 40 Raiders. Here's the next story. Now, usually after a Raiders win, I'm going to be hype, man. But I do have to bring up the fact that already this is being thrown out there and is Alex Leatherwood already being considered a bust after just two games in the league. I am going to give it to Chucky Heads. And the reason why I'm going to give it to Chucky Heads is because, first off, he's been bad. And not only has he been bad, I think he's been the worst right tackle, maybe the worst tackle in all of football through the first two games. Plus, Brandon Parker looked a lot better than him. That's never a good thing. The other reason why I'm going to say to everyone out there, hey, pump the brakes. Remember Colt Miller, his first year in the NFL? Wasn't all that good. He really, really struggled. Sometimes it takes some of these guys to get acclimated to the speed of the game and really learn some of your uh, simple, I'll say, blocking packages. But what's really, really concerning me is the fact that he's bad as what he's been in pass blocking. His grade right now, according to PFF, 14.6. 14.6 guys it really doesn't get much worse than that he's given up three sacks and sure he's had a tough uh go against tj watt before he got injured and then bad penalties i mean we're talking about penalties in the red zone inside the five yard line bringing him back i'm gonna still cross my fingers that he's okay he's gonna be battling an injury he's gonna be questionable for week three but let's face it he has to step up so what is your confidence level right now in alex leatherwood from a scale from zero to ten zero being you're not confident whatsoever in them right now. 10 being Mitch, shut the hell up. It's all going to be okay. I'm a 10. I'm probably going to go somewhere around a 2 or a 3. Somebody who looked as good as what he did in training camp, but he's looked as bad as what he has. I mean, you have to face the facts. It's kind of scary, man. Let's go to the last story here. Henry Ruggs, is he going to have over 1,000 receiving yards? I mean, when you really think about the fact that they drafted him number 12 overall in the 2020 draft, people were throwing out the bust word last season with him. He only had 26 catches, 426 yards. In terms of having over 1,000 yards, I'm going to give this one only one shocky hit, and I'm going to say it's a small shred of truth, but when you look at his pace, he's on pace right now for 1,551 yards. He had 113 yards and a touchdown up against the Pittsburgh Steelers this past week on five catches. The one thing that I like, Gruden, they are trying to get him more involved. So he had seven targets against the Steelers. He's got 12 targets through two weeks, but if you're watching the game, they are moving him all over the football field, whether it's with motion, whether it's just a pre-snap reads. Derek Carr is trying to figure out which guys got Henry Ruggs, and last week, I thought they did a phenomenal job up against the Steelers where the cornerback brought a blitz. Carr read it, and he's like, all right, I got Ruggs and another guy one-on-one. -on -one. Mika Fitzpatrick's not quick enough to catch him, and what happened? 61-yard touchdown to the house. So I'm going to say under 1,000 yards. My initial projection for Ruggs was 746. I hope I am really, really wrong because he is already whooping my butt in that category. So how many yards for Ruggs this upcoming season? I want you guys to go ahead and let me know down in the comments section. Now, every single time I make a video, I always tell people, hey, hit me up on Instagram. Let me know what you're thinking about the past game. Let me know what you're thinking about the segments that I'm doing. Or if you just want to know more Raiders news and rumors, on, to, on my Instagram stories right now, you can find all the Raiders snap counts from this past week. You can also find the top 10 best PFF grades and the five worst PFF grades from the Raiders from uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers game. So speaking of the Steelers game, coming up right now, we're going to get into some winners and losers up against Pitt. I'm going to give you the five biggest winners, and I'm going to give you the five biggest losers. The reason why I like to do this segment is because I always think even if you win a game, you still have to be able to get better and point the finger at those losers, but I also want to be able to hype up a lot of the guys that showed out. At number five, it's Daniel Carlson. I get that he's a kicker, but kickers are people too. He was terrific week one up against the Ravens, and he was really good against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, it was nine to seven going into the half, four for four for field goals, 
Two for two for extra points. I mean, he's been absolutely dialed in. When Daniel Carlson walks out onto that field, I'll tell you what, man. There is no better, there's no better kicker right now in the league, I personally think, than Carlson. And seeing the fact that the Minnesota Vikings kicker yesterday missed a field goal, 36-yard chip shot, and an extra point, and the Vikings lost, they're like, damn, maybe we should have kept that Carlson guy. At number four, I'm going to go with Casey Hayward. And for people that are probably looking at box scores, they're like, wait a minute, how do you have Casey Hayward over Trevon Mullen? And it's kind of simple to me. Nobody's throwing the ball near Hayward. So when you look at his numbers, two tackles, two pass breakups, you're like, how do you have a better game than Mullen who had seven tackles and an interception? The interception by Mullen was impressive, but people aren't throwing the ball anywhere near Hayward. And when they do, he's making them pay for it knocking it down. I mean, the receivers aren't getting really any yards against him. I have been very impressed and overall, I believe he had the third highest grade for all Raiders players on PFF. Let's go to number three here, Solomon Thomas. Sometimes, man, you just need to change the scenery. And in terms of the defensive line play, one of the biggest reasons why Thomas wanted to come here defense reminded him of Stanford. A big knock on him this offseason, he wasn't big enough. I mean, he looked pretty damn big to me in this past game. He had two tackles, Two sacks, a tackle for loss, three quarterback hits, and one pass breakup. He was moving all over the defensive line, and you can tell that he's really inspired to play with us right now. At number two, it's Henry Ruggs. I mean, anytime you're drafted in the first round, people expect a lot out of you, and especially when all the rumors I feel like the last two years have been, let's get Derek Carr number one. Let's get Derek Carr a top receiver. I'm not saying that Ruggs is the number one because, let's face it, I don't care if it's Renfro. I don't care if it's Ruggs. Renfro also probably should get some love on this video because that's one of the toughest dudes out there. He was picking up clutch first downs. But the biggest play of Ruggs' career, maybe the second biggest, because I'll throw that Jets touchdown up there as well, but that 61-yarder of the house, they're starting to use him a lot more. I'm telling you what, if you have him, if, if you're in a fantasy league and Henry Ruggs is out there, Go ahead and pick him up, especially in standard leagues, because I anticipate the Raiders to throw the football a whole bunch with that offensive line. And the biggest winner, I mean, you guys knew it was coming, right? I mean, it's Derek Carr. The fact that he's been able to spread the wealth all over the football field, the fact that the Steelers took away Darren Waller the way they did yesterday. Now, Waller still got his. You're not going to stop Waller. You can try to slow him down. But 28-37, 382 yards, two touchdowns. He's got 817 passing yards throughout the season. But it's not only that. It's the leadership, and he just knows this offense. I mean, how many times yesterday did he walk up to the line, and then all of a sudden, he's got this hand motion down. I don't know what this means, but I like maybe he's chopping it up with Savvy Lifestyle, changing up the play, but he's doing a phenomenal job being able to read the defenses, and they're not taking so many deep shots, but there's a lot of completions, and he's really spreading it out. I mean, the fact that Renfro, the fact that Brian Edwards, I mean, Foster Rose getting some targets. I mean, you just can't figure out who you're going to cover. Five different Raiders receivers yesterday had over five catches. That's really tough, and that's a big credit to Derek Carr. So let me know down in the comments section, y'all, who was the Raiders' biggest winner after their Week 2 win up against the Pittsburgh Steelers? I anticipate everyone to say Derek Carr, and in fact, after the game, my mom, who's dating a Steelers fan, she messaged me. She said, hey, I was rooting for the Raiders the entire week. I've been rooting for the Raiders this entire game. Derek Carr, he did a good job. The fact that my mom said Derek Carr did a good job kind of goes out to show that, guess what? That guy's playing on an incredible level. Now, if you love the shirt that I'm wearing right now, I got to give some love to Autumn Abyss. Go ahead, go to AutumnAbyss.com. Well, they got really, really high-quality Raiders gear. It feels better than dry fit as well. I absolutely love the What Happens in Vegas started in the town shirt. I got a lot of compliments when I wore that one this past weekend or two weekends ago now in Las Vegas. We got a Bo Jackson shirt. The Charles Woodson is probably my personal favorite. Also, since uh, Autumn Abyss is owned by some Raider fans, portions of all the proceeds, they go to charities that help kids in Oakland. They go to proceeds that help uh, the Tom Flores Foundation. This is an amazing company doing amazing things. If you need some new Raiders here, AutumnAbyss.com, and if you want to save 20%, once you go to that link down there below, click Enter the Abyss on the webpage, and you save an extra 20%. All right, we're going to go through the losers now up against the Pittsburgh Steelers because uh, we got to face it, right? I mean, there's certain opportunities where you can get better, and the Raiders, even though they're 2-0, you can still get better. At number five, it's Dale 11, and I feel kind of bad putting this one on here because Levitt did have an incredible play. It was third and ten, had a pass break up, put his head right on the ball, and unfortunately for him, had to leave the game. Hopefully he's okay, but the reason why he's on this list is because when you look at all the other Raiders cornerbacks or defensive backs, Levitt and another guy coming up here on the show, 
is clearly not quite up to the same pace. He had four tackles, he had a pass breakup, but he had a very bad missed tackle on Najee Harris that led to a Steelers touchdown early on, which kind of got some momentum going for them. I was a little bit worried, but uh, Levitt is the loser here. Let's go to number four, Corey Littleton. Littleton, back-to-back -back weeks, probably the worst Raiders linebacker on the roster. The amount of money that this guy's making, let's just face it, he's not playing up to par. Once Nicholas Morrow comes back, whenever that is, I anticipate Corey Littleton to take a step back on the bench. I do anticipate Nick Kwiatkowski to be able to play this week. Denzel Perriman, he had 11 tackles, but it's the Paul Gunther defense, and now it's the Gus Bradley defense. The only player that I see struggling, still not knowing exactly where he is, is Littleton. And as much as, he, as talented as he was with the Rams, as smart as he was in that defense, to me it's more of a work ethic thing, not so much the talent of Littleton. Littleton has the talent. To me right now it just seems like he's not putting in the work. Let's go to number three. We got John Simpson, left guard of the Las Vegas Raiders. I was kind of split. Do I put Andre James in this game? He had a bad fumble, which people are going to say, oh, it was on Derek. It wasn't. Andre James literally snapped the ball into his ball sack, and Derek just dropped it. I mean, what do you want the guy to do? In terms of overall grade, 32.4 PFF grade this past week, the Raiders couldn't run the foot ball going into the fourth quarter I believe it was like 16 carries for 17 yards I mean there's just no no push upright I mean you want to talk about Raiders running backs through two weeks this is again because of this interior offensive line 36 rushing attempts 86 yards the Raiders have 111 yards after contact there is no team out there right now that's blocking worse in the run game than the Las Vegas Raiders at number two in terms of some losers versus the Steelers Damon Arnett Arnett, I believe, was only on the field for 21 snaps, gave up two catches, 68 yards. But the reason why I'm going to put Arnett on this list, he had the lowest PFF grade among all Raiders players, 29.9. But it was a bonehead play, and I get it. If Casey Hayward or Mullen are out of the game, guess what? The Steelers, they're going to come after Arnett. It's really as simple as that. And he needs to be ready to go. Claypool burns him, and then instead of touching Claypool down, Arnett kept running. He kept running to the end zone. Thank the Lord Merrick had his, you know, was actually paying attention and was able to touch Claypool down or else he would just want to got up and ran in for a giant touchdown. So not only did he give up a big time play, the biggest play of the game, it was a bonehead move. I mean, Damon, you got to wake the hell up, man. And at number one, the biggest loser up against the Steelers, it has to be Alex Leatherwood. And I don't even know if it's all that close. When you look at the overall grade, 31.9, that's bad. He's got a run blocking grade somewhere around 65, but a pass blocking grade of 14.6. Have you guys ever gotten a 14.6 on a test? Imagine telling your parents at home, hey, this is what I got on my math test today. I dare you, go ahead, do it. Just see the reaction and then send it to me on Twitter or Instagram. I would love to be able to share it. The fact that Brandon Parker's out playing him, he's already given up three sacks this season, but it's also the penalties. And it's penalties and big time situations. Alex Leatherwood needs to wake the hell up or I'm gonna start throwing out the B word. All right, so let me know down in the comments, y'all, who was the Raiders' biggest loser after their game up against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I know they won this game 26-17, but there is a t there's ways to be able to improve and continue to get better. I want to go 3-0. and I want to go 4-0, and but the ultimate goal is a Super Bowl. But before I go out of here, who was the Raiders' biggest loser up against the Steelers?